recording this program, so welcome everybody. Uh, again, this is Richard Mollett with the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, and I need to, pardon me, let me, I'm actually going to stop recording this program. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our program on our new report that just came out this um, this morning. Oops, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I, um, uh, I unfortunately just switched my screen, so hopefully you can all see that. Uh, again, we're going to be talking about our new report, Animal Care Standards versus Nursing Home Resident Experiences, an appraisal of the extent to which nursing home conditions fail to meet the standards of care for animals in zoos and other settings. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about. I'll talk about it, uh, a little bit of background to get us started, if I can move this. There we go. Uh, so a little bit about us. Um, those most of you, I think, know us. We're the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization entirely dedicated to improving care and quality of life for residents in uh, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, and assisted living primarily. We also are very proud to be home of the Hudson Valley, New York, long-term care arms and program. We mostly do policy analysis and systems advocacy, both in New York State and nationally, but more and more in recent years because of uh, frustrations, I would say, and um, uh, in terms of the implementation of the standards, in terms of residents realizing the rights uh, to good care, to life with dignity, et cetera, that they are entitled to. We've been doing a lot more education of consumers, families, long-term care ombudsmen, and people who work with them to help equip people, um, uh, those individuals, uh, with knowledge about their rights and the tools that they can use to have those rights uh, and overcome challenges, have those rights implemented and overcome challenges in long-term care facilities. Uh, I'll be speaking today and I'll be joined by Adara Balanajad, who is an attorney with LTCCC and the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and who, with whom we work very closely on our policy advocacy work, and Eric Goldwine, who joined us last year, last summer, I think, as a policy fellow. And Eric is a recent graduate from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. So what are we going to be talking about today? Again, we're going to be talking about the new report that we just released this morning, it's um, kind of a, uh, I would say, a little bit in your face in the sense that, you know, wow, you know, what is, uh, you know, what does this mean? What are we writing about? Why do we write it? So I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. Uh, essentially, I had thought about this last year. We got started doing the research last summer, but, you know, so many family members over the years have come up to me and said, you know, you know and upset distraught and they say you know, they wouldn't treat a dog the way that their mother or father or daughter um, was treated by a nursing home. And there was a headline last year, just about um, 11 months ago, a uh, former skilled nursing facility mogul sold his patients like cattle, jurors told. And that really got me thinking, you know, um, things are so bad in nursing homes um, in, in many of our nursing homes, not all of them, of course, but you know, for, for many, many residents, uh, what can we do? How can we put a spotlight on this? Another thing that I just wanted to quickly mention, because it's just so painful and striking to me, uh, there were two U.S. Senate hearings last year on nursing home care. There was also a House Ways and Means Committee hearing in the fall on uh, care for our elders in the United States. But this first bullet, I just wanted to mention, a woman testified that her, quote, my final memories of my mother's life now include watching her bang uncontrollably on her private parts for days after the rape with tears rolling down her eyes, apparently trying to tell me what, what had been done to her, but unable to speak due to her disease. The woman had dementia. And it was just, um, I've read it many times, obviously written about it, and it's just completely heart rendering. And uh, I've personally experienced um, not not something as tragic as that, but heartbreak and um, you know seeing someone in pain that was unnecessary, uh, someone that I cared for in a nursing home, and so many of our the residents with whom we're in touch, the ombudsman, and of course the families witnessed that uh, themselves or with people that they care about. So the 
the the um, Senate hearing, you know, that woman testified, another woman testified. There was expert testimony at both those hearings. There was expert testimony at the House Ways and Means Committee. And what really, frankly, infuriated me is uh, or was CMS's response to those reports. They proposed relaxing the standards of care, reducing, you know, the basic uh, federal requirements for nursing homes. They proposed reducing survey frequency from a minimum of an annual survey for every single licensed nursing home to uh, allowing so-called top performing facilities to be surveyed every 30 months to three years. And as I note here in the, in the PowerPoint, there are numerous studies that have shown that there are significant problems in so-called top performing facilities. Uh, you know, issues that we've discussed in other webinars and, and in our other work over the years. And then in addition, CMS actually took concrete steps two years ago to cut penalties for abuse and neglect. And we have seen those penalties, which are infrequent to begin with, actually go down when a nursing home harms a resident due to substandard care, uh, abuse, or neglect. And so, you know, my question was, as I note here at the bottom, how bad does nursing home care have to get before our state and federal leaders take action? Um, where is the outrage in terms of what's going on? And that's why I thought it was really important to do something that is a little bit different uh, and a little bit provoking because I know I'm angry about it and I can only imagine what how residents and how their loved ones feel um, in, in the face of some of these issues. And really the purpose of the report is you know, we know the federal requirements are strong. As I said at the very beginning, we've moved more and more to educating families and residents and ombudsmen and, and, and advocates because the requirements are good. The requirements don't need to be changed. The requirements need to be enforced. It needs to be made clear to nursing homes that they have to abide by these standards that um, residents and, and their loved ones uh, entrust those facilities with. Uh, we've been really concerned, as I mentioned, that, that, you know, CMS and the state enforcement agencies, that they are uh, turning their backs on, on residents, as I just mentioned in the previous slide, but that they allow nursing homes to have violations year after year. The average facility has seven, I think, violations per year. We have a large number of facilities. Last time we looked, it was about 40% that have repeats of the same deficiency year after year after year, what we call chronic deficiencies. And that the nursing home industry, which um, their lobbyists are extremely powerful and extremely wealthy, the two big lobbying associations are sitting on about $30 million each. Uh, and then they're in Congress, they're in our state capitals, that they are making themselves out to be the victims and they are making themselves out of the ones who need relief from what's going on in the situation. So ultimately we asked ourselves, you know, how do the experience of residents uh, who are faced with such significant challenges even stack up against the requirements and the expectations for the care and the, for the treatment of animals? I just want to note here, we note this several times in the report, we certainly do not want to trivialize the experiences of either nursing home residents or animals our point is to illustrate how systemic failures to hold nursing homes accountable for abuse and neglect too often subject residents to conditions that not only fall below the federal nursing home standards of care, but also below ex accepted standards for the humane treatment of animals. And, and the research that we did, which we'll talk about shortly, is uh, I thought was really interesting and in some cases really stunning. But um, before we move on, I just want a little bit about the report. We looked at 11 key areas that we thought were important to uh, an individual's care, uh, quality of life, from infection control and prevention to food service, making sure food is nitration, is nutritious, excuse me, to of course freedom from abuse and neglect. And the report is, it's long, but it's broken up into very short chapters to make it as usable as possible. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we, um, we also put together 11 briefs. So each of these chapters is, um, has been distilled into a two-page two brief 
that you can use uh, to support your knowledge, your advocacy, whether it be in a nursing home or when you're uh, speaking to a state or national legislator. So without further ado, I am going to move on and we're going to hand the program over to, I believe, Eric? Yes, yes. Thank you, Great. Richard. Great. And Thanks, Eric. Thank you to, yeah. And thank, thank you, Richard. Thank you. I, I understand we have uh, 134 attendees here. And uh, I'm glad to be able to, 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 to share these findings with you uh, about, about our report. Uh, just to uh, get a few things out of the way before I start, uh, we're going to be focusing on a, uh, one or two regulations for each category. They are, uh, uh, there are more relevant relevant regulations and standards, but we're going to be highlighting uh, just one or two. And I'm going to be going over the first half of the first six categories uh, before I hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dara. And within each category, uh, we're going to start with a our cover page examples, which compare uh, animal standard to a nursing home experience. Uh, then we'll dig a little deeper with a resident care standard. Uh, followed by uh, uh, an overview of an animal care standard and some quick facts about the state of nursing home conditions for a given category uh, before going over a resident experience found either on a on a news report or a statement of deficient deficiency through medicare.gov so we're going to start with with our first category which is uh, freedom from abuse and neglect uh, on the left uh, we see an example of of an animal care regulation from the standards for new world primates which protects primates from abuse deprivation of food uh, and water and other uh, forms of abuse. And as as we all know, the conditions in nursing homes often don't even pass, wouldn't even pass muster if, there, if they were in a, a zoo. Uh, on the right, we see a, a troubling example of a 87-year-old with dementia who was denied water for several days and died from extreme dehydration. And this was a five-star a facility that had a five-star rating at the time. Um, so if we could uh, move to our next slide, uh, just to, to go over what the federal standards are for uh, abuse and neglect. Uh, residents are protected from, from uh, nursing home residents are protected from abuse and neglect of any kind, and this includes corporal punishment, involuntary seclusion, and physical, any physical or chemical restraint. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, these uh, these regulations are often not enforced at, but the, at many nursing homes across the country. And, and if we if we go to our next slide, we can see a similar animal care standard. Uh, this, this is from the USDA Animal Welfare Act, uh, which states that zoo handling, uh, uh, handling of all animals should be done in a manner that does not cause trauma, overheating, excessive cooling, stress, physical harm, or unnecessary discomfort. So there's ample evidence that regulations uh, for nursing home abuse and neglect are not enforced, uh, according to a 2010 American Journal of Public Health Study, one in 10 of the residents sampled in their study experienced, reported experiencing some type of abuse or potential neglect. Uh, there's evidence that conditions are, are getting worse uh, in nursing home abuse citations more than doubled between uh, 2013 and 2017, according to a 2019 Government Accountability Office report. And uh, there's also evidence that that a lot of the instances of abuse and neglect are not even being uh, reported. In fact, uh, a OIG report found that 84% of the sampled 7,800 potential abuse and neglect incidents uh, were not reported. Nursing homes failed to report 84% of those. And if we move on to uh, we can see that there are faces to these troubling statistics. 
Uh, and this is one of many stories that you'll find in, uh, on the news or on the Medicare statement of deficiencies. There was an 83-year-old resident with Alzheimer's at a Minnesota facility who was raped by a male, male caregiver, which is troubling in and of itself, making matters uh, worse was that this caregiver had been a main suspect in at least two sexual abuse cases at the facility. Uh, this was, uh, as Richard mentioned before, there was a U.S. Senate Finance Committee hearing which, which uh, detailed uh, several cases of abuse, and the daughter testified at this hearing saying, my final memories of my mother's life now include watching her bang uncontrollably on her private parts for days after the rape with tears rolling down her eyes, apparently trying to tell me what had been done to her, but unable to speak due to her disease. Um, so uh, moving on to our next category, uh, general care and treatment. Uh, we see that there are, stand, there are standards for animals and in zoo facilities, uh, our example here is all man animals must be well cared for and presented in a manner reflecting modern zoological practices. Uh, and an example, uh, in a nursing home facility that wouldn't pass muster in a, in a zoo was at a Maryland nursing home uh, facility, failed to properly implement base care baseline care plans for two residents, including one resident who was admitted to the facility after for rehab after surgery. And the resident's care plan did not address the potential for pain and discomfort. Uh, and, and if we can move on to our next slide. So uh, a in, in the nursing home facility, there is a, uh, a federal regulation stating facilities must conduct an initially and periodically a comprehensive, accurate, and standardized reproducible assessment for each of each resident's functional capacity. And facilities must make an assessment of a resident's needs, strengths, uh, goals, life history, and preferences. And uh, there's evidence that these regulations are not always enforced and in some cases poorly enforced. And uh, we see a comparable animal care regulation by the uh, by the American Association of Zoo Veterinarians, stating that procedures and treatments uh, performed in animals must employ current professionally accepted methods of diagnosis and treatment, and that there should be a standard operating policy providing appropriate medical care for all sick and injured animals. So uh, the government and academic research paints a grim picture about the state of uh, care and treatment for nursing home residents, including a uh, OIG 2000 report, which found that one in three Medicare beneficiaries experienced harm in post-acute skilled nursing facilities. Uh, this is incredibly costly. The report estimates that that uh, harm, that, that hospital care associated with treating this harm costs Medicare approximately $2.8 billion in a single year. That's billion with a B. Uh, and it, it, another troubling statistic is, uh, that we, we found is that there's uh, close to 90,000 nursing home residents who suffer, suffer from pressure ulcers uh, every day. And uh, a resident's experience that will highlight, there's a must-read Kaiser Health News report uh, from 2017, uh, which details a 58-year-old woman's uh, months-long odyssey from budget motels to acquaintances' uh, couches to hospital ERs because she was pushed out of a for-profit nursing home in uh, California. And across the country, there are residents like this uh, who are uh, suffering from uh, from improper because of improper discharges and and who are not uh, being given the access to uh, nursing home facilities that they are entitled to. So our next uh, topic is staffing, which 
uh, we all know is so central to quality of care. And it's also, it's, this is true in nursing home settings and it's also true in, in zoo settings. Uh, the, uh, the AZA requires a minimum of two qualified elephant keepers to be present at any time, uh, a keepers within the trunk's reach of an elephant. Um, and here we see an example of a, a nursing home facility uh, which which uh, suffered a terrible, I shouldn't call it an accident, but suffered a terrible consequences of its lack of staffing when a resident uh, suffered a fractured femur because the facility improperly transferred the resident with only one staff member rather than two. And so uh, facilities, uh, there are federal regulations requiring facilities to have sufficient numbers of staffing, uh, including uh, uh, the following types of personnel on a 24 hour basis to provide nursing care to all residents in accordance with nursing care plans. Uh, this includes uh, licensed nurses and other nursing personnel, including but not limited to nursing aides. And under federal law, nursing homes are required to have registered registered nurse on duty eight hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and as with uh, nursing home settings, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums uh, states that there must be an adequate number of trained paid and unpaid staff to care for the animals to manage, uh, to manage the many programs uh, provided by zoos. So there's serious consequences to this uh, to this lack this staffing shortage, uh, but just to give you an idea of of the uh, of how prevalent this problem is, there's research that the average nursing home uh, maintains only 3.4 total care staff hours per resident per day. The a 2001 landmark study suggested or indicated that there should be at least 4.1 hours. And over the last uh, two decades, there's uh, more current research that suggests that number should be even higher. Um, and a health affairs study uh, indicated that three out of four nursing homes were almost never in compliance with what CMS expected uh, RN staffing levels to be. So there's many nursing homes across the country that are suffering from these staffing shortages. And as as noted before, a uh, understaffed facility can endanger the residents in that facility. The, uh, in this case, uh, which which I briefly discussed a couple minutes ago, there was a resident at a Wisconsin facility where uh, a staff member attempted to transfer the resident alone because two of the other uh, aides were busy. And the result of this solo transfer was the resident lunging forward and beginning to slide out of her chair and suffering a fractured femur. And despite the serious injury, this violation was cited as no harm. So moving on to nutrition and hydration. Uh, I, here we see that there are requirements in, in the Animal Welfare Act that food should be free of contamination and it should be palatable, palatable and there should be sufficient quantity and it, nutritive value to meet the normal dairy requirements for the condition and size of the guinea pig or hamster. So we're talking about guinea pigs and hamsters here. And our nursing home resident experience uh, details a New York facility that failed to provide food of nutritive value, palatable, and served at the proper temperature as residents, residents complained that uh, hot meals were served cold. Uh, 
uh, federal standards uh, require that meals are healthy, appropriate for the individual and appetizing. Uh, the Food and Nutrition Services section uh, highlights how facilities must provide each resident with a nourishing, palatable, well-balanced diet that meets their nutritional and special dietary needs, taking into consideration the preferences of each resident. And the, Amer the Association of Zoos and Aquariums uh, states that if the institutions follow a written nutrition program that meets the behavioral and nutritional needs of all species, individuals and colonies or groups in the inst institution, uh, animal diets must meet the quality and quantity necessary to ensure each animal's nutritional and psychological needs. So. In the nursing home settings, in spite of the regulations, which I just mentioned, uh, there's a uh, high prevalence of malnourishment and dehydration, uh, including there's uh, a Journal of Gerontology study that notes that food and fluid consumption is less than the federal criterion for 64 to 80% of nursing home residents. And a new 2020 study in Age and Aging found that nearly half of residents had impending, impending or current dehydration. Uh, Eric, I just want to interject and thank you so much that we're, mm -hmm. you know, um, we have a lot of slides and a lot of information, so we're going fairly quickly. But on each of these slides and in the report itself and in the briefs, we have links to the related fact sheets and, and to the primer and to some of the resources that we have on our website, nursinghome411.org. So for instance, if you're concerned about the food that your resident is getting or, or if you're an Amazon or advocate and you're seeing that in your nursing home, you can use those materials and they're all free to use and share to, uh, to advocate, to say, you know, well, this is what the resident is entitled to in the way of receiving food at different hours, which is sometimes a problem, or food that is uh, nutritious and palatable to them. Because, uh, for instance, in terms of hydration, dehydration and malnourishment are very significant issues for nursing home residents, and they are something that can lead to other issues as well. So thanks, Eric. All right. Thank you. All right. So there's countless examples of residents reporting that they're, uh, of report of surveyors finding that residents are not getting the nutrition and hydration that they, that they need. Uh, the report we're highlighting is a woman who suffered a significant weight loss. I believe this was from 117 pounds to 109 pounds. And this weight loss occurred because of the facility's failure to carry out the dietitian's order to provide snacks to counter decreases in her weight. And just to make matters worse, the, in, in addition to this, uh, this woman suffering, an, investi an investigation found that the facility was falsifying records to indicate that the resident was receiving an eating food, which she had neither uh, received nor eaten. So uh, we, we just discussed palatable and nutritious food. Uh, safe food handling is equally important. Uh, and there are standards in for, for animals and for zoos. Uh, we highlight here that food should be stored in facilities which adequately protect against spoilage or deterioration and infestation or contamination by vermin. Uh, and our nursing home example, there's a recent report on fairwarning.org, uh, which is a scary but very fascinating report which uh, detailed cockroach infestations, moldy ice machines, mouse droppings, and many other um, awful conditions found in nursing homes. And uh, there was one example where uh, a norovirus uh, outbreak sickened 29 residents and 32 staff members at a Wisconsin facility. So these these uh, deficiencies have have real consequences and can affect uh, not just the residents but the staff members. 
So there are food safety requirements in nursing homes. They require that nursing homes obtain food from government approved sources and that they store, prepare, <coughs> distribute, and serve food in accordance with <coughs> professional standards for food safety. And similarly, the Animal Welfare Act uh, also requires safe food handling and that saying it should be stored in facilities which adequately protect against spoilage or deterioration and infestation or contamination by vermin, which seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, but the, uh, as with the other categories, there's numerous pieces of research that indicate that safe food handling is a uh, problem in nursing homes. Uh, in fact, food storage was the second most uh, cited deficiency in nursing homes, according to a CMS survey. Survey. Uh, this is problematic. This would be problematic in a restaurant or a kitchen, but it's especially problematic for nursing home facilities where the residents are highly vulnerable to viral infections, uh, particularly those involving the neurovirus, which is the leading cause of acute uh, gastroenteritis and foodborne illness in foodborne disease in the United States. And from the fair warning report, uh, there were 230 foodborne outbreaks from 1998 to 2017 in long-term care settings. And these outbreaks resulted in 54 deaths, 532 hospitalizations, and sickened 77 or 70, 7,648 people. And these figures are Sorry. almost certainly under undercounted. Uh, a, one of uh, many resident experiences that we could have highlighted uh, stood out to me uh, because the uh, surveyor found a can opener that was covered in dried brown food debris. Uh, this is uh, they also found that the freezer was not sealed properly and ice had formed on the food near the freezer door. And many of the food products were covered with ice due to this malfunctioning freezer. These are uh, conditions you wouldn't want for anybody, let alone nursing home residents. And uh, Medical supervision is uh, essential in both uh, animal settings and uh, nursing home facilities. Our uh, the Animal Welfare Act states that uh, that veterinarians should conduct conduct on-site evaluations for each cetacean at, at least once a month, and that these evaluations should include a visual inspection of the animal and examination of behavioral feeding and medical records. And in a nursing home facility, we, uh, the example on, on our right here is uh, a resident who did not receive the medical supervision that they were entitled to. Uh, they were inappropriately administered insulin injections uh, despite a note, discharge note stating in capital letters, please avoid giving this patient insulin. Ooh. That's okay. Um, so a, uh, a, another resident experience which we can highlight, uh, if we could go to the next slide, you guys think we have a slide. Oh, sorry, I went backwards. Yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. So uh, the resident care standards uh, require uh, that, that I, uh, Nursing homes are required to ensure the medical care of each resident is supervised by a physician and that they should be seen by a physician at least once every 30 days for the first 90 days after admission and at least once every 60 days after. And the federal rules also dictate that a resident has the right to choose their attending physician. Uh, similarly, the Animal Welfare Act uh, requires that an attending, as mentioned before, attending veterinarian should conduct on-site evaluations monthly and that these evaluations include visual inspections and examination of behavioral feeding and medical records. So 
so some some troubling statistics uh, about this. Uh, there were 3,876 citations for failing to provide sufficient nursing and physician services in 2018. And there's an average 300 citations annually for failure to administer a nursing home in a way that maintains the well-being of each resident. Uh, and this is just in 2018, there were 938 citations for failing to ensure uh, nursing staff have the appropriate competencies and skills to care for each resident of the facility. So this failure to provide adequate, adequate medical supervision has consequences both big and small. Uh, in this uh, example that I highlight, there was a resident, there were actually two residents where a Portland facility failed to provide appropriate services and devices to increase their range of motion, uh, and in one case, is, in one case to increase range of motion, and in another to decrease range of motion. Uh, both residents had uh, left hand contractures, but were observed not wearing their splint uh, devices, uh, even though the rec their records indicated that they should, and this placed the residents at risk for worsening their conditions, though the violation was cited as no harm. Um, so I'm going to pass this off to my colleague Dara, who's going to be discussing the next several categories. Thanks, Eric. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, before I begin, I just want to um, go back and note and re reiterate one thing. Um, and that's that while the federal nursing home standards um, do provide for higher level of care with more specific requirements and guidance, uh, the resident care standards and animal care standards are not entirely dissimilar, which I think, um, you know, Eric helped point out um, in the first half of the slides. Um, and I think this similarity helps illustrate to some extent the importance of these types of care to all living things. Um, and thus, when facilities fail to adhere to the standards for resident care, and even fall below the standards for animal care, um, from my perspective, that really shows a shocking failure to treat residents with the most basic level of respect and dignity. Thanks, Dr. Um, going... If I may, that really gets at the heart of, of what we're doing here and what we've been doing the last yeah. half year or so of research. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so um, over to the first topic that I'll be covering, which is stimulating and safe environments. Um, and on the left, you have the animal care standard, um, and that's the physical environment in the primary enclosures must be enriched by providing means of expressing non-injurious species typical activities. Um, species differences should be considered when determining the type or methods of enrichment. And on the right, you have um, a nursing home resident's experience. Um, at a Minnesota facility, a resident who was unable to communicate had a care plan which called for daily independent activities and interventions including stimulating music, television, and other activities. Um, unfortunately, a the surveyor observed several days in which the resident was lying in bed with the lights on without any music, television, or interaction from staff. Next slide, please. Taking a deeper dive, uh, we see that the federal nursing home standards require nursing homes to provide, based on the comprehensive assessment and care plan and the preferences of each resident, an ongoing program to support residents in their choice of activities, both facility-sponsored group and individual activities, and independent activities, designed to meet the interests of and support the physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being of each resident encouraging both independence and interaction in the community. And uh, looking at CMS's interpretive guidance, you see that activities are meaningful when they reflect a person's interest and lifestyle, are enjoyable to the person, help the person to feel useful, and provide a sense of belonging. Next slide, please. Um, and here is the uh, animal care standard. Um, I'm not going to repeat it just because um, I just went over it in the in the first slide, and for the sake of time, I'll leave uh, enough time for questions and answers at the end. But I do want to oh, again highlight. Oh, that's all right. And I I do want to uh, again highlight that the requirements are similar. Um, you see both 
require the subject to be engaged in individualized activities uh, for nursing homes that's based on the individual resident and for um, under the Animal Welfare Act that's based on the species. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here are some quick nursing home facts relating to the topic. Uh, CDC study estimated that about half of nursing home residents have a diagnosis of depression, approximately twice the rate found in adult day services uh, centers and residential care communities. Um, a 2010 article noted that studies have found that nursing home residents with dementia spend the majority of their time engaged in no activity at all, with unstructured time accounting for two-thirds of the day or more. Next slide, please. Uh, now here is one resident's experience, um, and as the case with all of the examples in this uh, specific portion of my presentation, the story comes directly from statement of deficiencies found on CMS's Nursing Home Compare website and uh, featured in our Elder Justice newsletters available on our homepage. Um, so for this uh, case, a surveyor observed a resident sitting in bed, staring at the wall. The surveyor documented that the room did not have a television, radio, or reading materials. The resident stated, no one visits me except when they feed me. The resident added that he would like someone to read him the news or at least have a television. The social services assistant told the surveyor that although uh, placed in isolation because of a possible infection, the resident should have been provided with activities. Uh, and sadly, observations the next day again show that the resident was not engaged in any activities. The statement of deficiencies indicated that this violation had the potential to impact the resident's mental well-being. Um, and uh, as we can see, based on the total lack of any activities, the failure to provide uh, activities violates not only the nursing home standards of care, but also clearly even falls below the animal care standard. Next slide, please. Uh, our next topic is freedom from restraints. And on the left, you have the animal care standard, uh, which notes that non-human primates must not uh, be maintained in restraint devices unless required for health reasons as determined by the tending veterinarian or by research proposal approved by the committee at research facilities. And maintenance under such restraint must be for the shortest period possible. And on the right, you have a resident's experience, a resident's death at a nonprofit Massachusetts facility, uh, serves as a cautionary tale for the dangers of bed rails, Staff at the facility recalled that the resident's head was twisted sideways and stuck between the bottom of the bed rail and the bed frame. Next slide, please. Um, looking at the nursing home requirements, every nursing home resident has the right to be treated with respect and dignity. Um, and this includes the right to be free from any physical or chemical restraints imposed for purposes of discipline or convenience and not required to treat the resident's medical symptoms. When the use of restraints is indicated, the facility must use the least restrictive alternative for the least amount of time and document ongoing reevaluation of the need for restraints. And CMS's interpretive guidance uh, notes that physical side effects uh, include skin breakdown, incontinence, and entrapment, and psychological side effects include anxiety, aggression, and dehumanization. Next slide, please. Uh, again, here's the animal care standards, um, and it's strikingly similar. Uh, next slide, please. Quick facts um, dealing with this topic as it relates to both chemical and physical restraints. Um, so in terms of chemical restraints, approximately 20% of nursing home residents are administered antipsychotic drugs. Uh, often, they are used as a way of chemically restraining residents exhibiting the behavioral symptoms of dementia, um, and despite the FDA's black box warning against such use among elderly patients. Uh, recently published studies indicate that the percentage of residents being administered antipsychotic drugs much, uh, may be much higher. Uh, specifically, studies have found that nursing homes are increasing diagnoses of risk-adjusted conditions, such as schizophrenia, and are increasing use of other psychotropic drugs, such as mood stabilizers, to essentially gain the drugging rate. 
Um, and in terms of physical restraints, about 550 bed rail related deaths occurred from 1995 to 2012. And an estimated 36,000 injuries were treated in emergency room departments between 2003 and 2011. Next slide, please. Here's one resident's experience with physical restraints. Um, a resident was found wedged between the wall and her bed. Uh, records indicated that the resident's head was caught between the side rail and mattress. Most of her weight was dangling, pulling on her neck. A certified nurse aide told the severe that it was difficult to pull out the release knob and that there's no way that the resident could have moved the side rail. Sadly, this was not the first time the resident attempted to get out of bed. Her roommate uh, had told the surveyors uh, that she attempted to get out of bed often, and she fell just the other evening trying to get out. Um, the facility was cited for failing to identify the use of bed rails as a restraint and failing to reassess their use after the, after the resident attempted to climb over the bed rail. Next slide, please. And I just want to give you all a policy update in relation to this topic. Um, in 2019, CMS issued a proposed rule that lowers the standards for both bed rails and antipsychotic drugs. In regards to bed rails, uh, current regulations require attempts to implement appropriate alternatives before installing bed rails. Um, but CMS's proposal would allow facilities to, re to place residents in beds with rails already installed. Um, instead, just requiring staff to assess residents uh, for entrapment prior to use. And for antipsychotics, current regulations limit PRN or as-needed orders to 14 days. Uh, extensions require the physician or practitioner to directly examine the resident to determine the appropriateness of the medication. But CMS's proposal would allow extensions without any direct examination uh, and assessment as long as the rationale and duration is recorded. Uh, uh, the Coalition and the Center for Medicare Advocacy submitted joint comments with other organizations in opposition to the proposed rule. Um, if you'd like to read uh, our comments and see your objections, um, please uh, follow the link on the slide. Next slide, please. So the next topic is treatment of injuries. And on, again, on the left, you have the animal care standard. And elephant skin must be thoroughly inspected on a daily basis and cared for uh, uh, as needed through bathing, removal of dead skin, treatment uh, of dry skin or other skin problems. The elephant skin should be supple, free of dead skin buildup and not cracked or dry. Um, and on the right, you have the resident's experience. Uh, several residents at a for-profit Tennessee nursing home were harmed after the facility failed to provide uh, prevent and treat their pressure ulcers. One resident who had not received uh, body audits for 35 days out of the 37 days since admission developed a stage four pressure ulcer on their left buttock. Uh, next slide, please. Um, under the nursing home reform law and uh, regulations, facilities must ensure that a resident receives care consistent with professional standards of practice to prevent pressure ulcers and does not develop pressure ulcers unless the individual's clinical condition demonstrates that they were unavoidable. And a resident with pressure ulcers uh, receives necessary treatment and services consistent with professional standards of practice to promote healing, prevent infection, and prevent new ulcers from developing. Uh, next slide, please. Again, here is the animal care standard. Um, next slide, please. Uh, facts relating to this topic, over 93,000 uh, current U.S. nursing home residents, or 7.3% have pressure ulcers, and about 85% of nursing home residents are at risk of developing pressure ulcers. And if you are interested in facility-specific data, we do periodically publish pressure ulcer rates for every licensed and certified nursing home on our website. Next slide, please. Um, here's one resident's experience with skin care. A resident's care plan noted that the resident had an unstable pressure ulcer on his left heel. The care plan called for staff to reposition the resident every two hours 
while the resident was awake, float the resident's heel off the bed, use a heel boot, and stop using socks until the wound healed. Observations show that the resident had been wearing socks, the resident's heel was not being elevated to release pressure, and the heel boot was uh, not being properly used. The surveyor cited the facility for failing to provide necessary treatment and services to prevent the development of an unstageable pressure ulcer. Next slide, please. Uh, the next topic is appropriate medications. On the left, the animal care standard requires written formal procedures uh, must be available to paid and unpaid animal care staff for the use of animal drugs for veterinary purposes and appropriate security of the drugs must be provided. On the right, the resident's experience. A certified nursing aide at an Indiana nursing home was accused of administering her own prescription narcotic to three patients who were acting disruptively, reportedly putting her personal medication uh, into their food. Next slide, please. Uh, Nursing home care standard uh, facilities must ensure that residents who have not used psychotropic drugs are not given these drugs unless the medication is necessary to treat a specific condition as diagnosed and documented in the clinical record. Residents who use psychotropic drugs uh, should receive gradual dose reductions and behavioral interventions unless clinically contraindicated in an effort to discontinue use. Residents uh, do not receive uh, psychotropic drugs pursuant to a PRN order unless that medication is necessary to treat a diagnosed specific condition that's documented in the clinical record. And just noting, um, current regulations require physicians or practitioners to evaluate residents for extensions of antipsychotic drugs beyond 14 days. Next slide, please. <coughs> And here is the animal care standard for comparison. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some quick facts about this topic. A systemic review found that 16 to 27% of residents and studies were victims of medication errors. A 2018 study found that nursing homes underreported antipsychotic prescribing Nursing homes did not identify up to 6,000 residents per calendar quarter as having received antipsychotics, despite these prescriptions being paid by Medicare and dispensed by pharmacy. Uh, a 2019 study found, sorry? Uh, a 2019 study found that nursing home residents with Parkinson's disease who were um, Taking inappropriate atypical antipsychotics had an increased risk of pneumonia compared to residents uh, taking appropriate atypical antipsychotics. Next slide, please. Uh, here's one resident's experience with antipsychotic uh, drugging. And I, do, and I uh, just want to reiterate that the nursing home standards are connected. So while I'm covering this under inappropriate medication, it could have easily been included in freedom of Freedom from restraints. Um, a resident was observed asleep at 10.30 a.m. while other residents were eating breakfast. Uh, um, at 11.45 a.m., the resident was still asleep. The following day, the resident's breakfast was untouched and a staff member tried to help the resident eat. According to the statement of deficiencies, the resident could not keep her eyes open. On the third day, the resident was asleep with her neck hyperextended and she was starting to slide from her wheelchair. This pattern continued for three additional days. The resident's record showed that she was receiving uh, a 10 milligram dose of an antipsychotic drug twice a day. However, the order was changed to one single 20 milligram dose every morning. The medical director said that the dose was changed because the insurance company would not cover the current form ordered in the divided dose. Next slide, please. Um, and just a reminder that in 2019, CMS issued the proposed rule uh, that lowers the standards for administering antipsychotic drugs. Um, next slide, please. So the next and last topic is infection control. On the left, uh, the animal care standard requires that institutions should be aware of and prepared for periodic disease outbreaks in wild or other domestic or exotic animal populations 
that might affect the institution's animals. Plans should be developed that outline steps to be taken to protect the institution's animals in these, set, in these situations. On the right, uh, a resident's experience, a Massachusetts facility that had a uh, gastrointestinal outbreak affecting 55 residents failed to provide and implement an infection prevention and control program. The facility did not uh, constantly follow precautions related to use of personal protective equipment and did not ensure staff training on hand washing. Next slide, please. So under the federal regulations, each facility must establish and maintain an infection prevention and control program designed to provide a safe, sanitary, and comfortable environment and to help prevent the development and transmission of communicable diseases and infections. The facility must establish an infection prevention and control program that must include, at a minimum, the following elements. Assist, assistance for preventing, identifying, reporting, investigating, and controlling infections, and communicable diseases for all residents staff, volunteers, visitors, and other individuals providing services under a contractual arrangement based upon the facility assessment and following accepted national standards. This includes the hand hygiene procedures to be followed by staff involved in direct resident contact. Next slide, please. Again, here is the animal care standard, um, adding that institution uh, should design facilities uh, excuse me, In institutions should design uh, facilities, uh, uh, um, policies, develop animal care protocols, and present animals for public contact in ways that minimize the risk, um, such as hand washing or hand sanitizing stations and signage. And the AZA policy for animal contact with public notes that the most effective method for disease prevention is a complete and thorough veterinary program and common sense sanitary measures. Next slide, please. Um, quick facts, uh, infections in long-term care facilities lead to approximately 388,000 deaths each year. Failure to provide sufficient infection control and prevention is the number one cited deficiency in the United States, and hand washing is the number one issue that surveyors, uh, quote unquote, uh, keep tripping on when it comes to infection prevention. Um, an estimated 1.6 to 3.8 million infections occur in residential care facilities across the nation each year, leading to an annual cost ranging from 673 million to 2 billion. Um, and a Kaiser Health News analysis of four years of federal inspection records found that lapses in infection control were the most frequent health violation citation, um, with 74% of nursing homes cited. And nonetheless, only one of 75 homes found deficient uh, received a high-level citation that uh, would likely result in a financial penalty. Next slide, please. Resident's experience. A uh, resident was in bed with liquid feces overflowing from his brief and pooling between his legs. For two hours, staff came in and out of the resident's room without providing care. The surveyor asked a certified nurse aide to provide care. Um, but the CNA stated that she had just checked on the resident uh, a few months ago. After seeing the resident, the CNA admitted that she had not checked on him. Uh, the CNA cleaned and changed the resident's brief. Uh, she then wet a, wash, uh, a washcloth and approached the resident, but the surveyor intervened and told the CNA to remove her gloves. The CNA acknowledged that she should have removed her gloves after cleaning the feces, but she was rushing to finish so she could go home. The facility was cited for failing to ensure proper infection control procedures. Next slide, please. Again, a uh, policy update. CMS's proposed revision to the nursing home requirements of participation um, also rolls back the infection preventionist uh, standards. So current regulations um, require facilities to have a part-time infection preventionist but the proposed rule removes the requirement for a part-time infection preventionist and requires instead that the infection preventionist devote only sufficient time to uh, the infection prevention and control um, at the facility. Next slide, please. 
And before I conclude, uh, I just want to highlight that all the resident experiences in my slides were um, cases where the surveyor cited the violation as causing neither actual harm to the resident nor placing the resident in immediate jeopardy. Uh, so essentially no harm. So not only did the facilities fail to meet the minimum care standards, but they likely were not uh, significantly punished um, for their failures through financial penalties. And if you want to learn more about no harm deficiencies, I highly recommend uh, looking at our Elder Justice newsletters. Um, next slide, please. Um, and lastly, I want to direct you all to the Action Center on our website. Um, so if you're feeling inspired after this presentation, yeah. um, from, there, <laughs> from there you can send a letter uh, either using uh, our template or writing your own uh, to your representatives in support of nursing home residents. And with that, I will turn it back over to Richard. Dara, thanks so much. Uh, so we're just after 2 o'clock. Uh, we're going to do a uh, – just wanted to point people again to the report. Uh, we have the – this is the report's website page, uh, nursinghome411.org. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side we have uh, the issue briefs, and they continue down. There's 11 dis different issue briefs. So as I mentioned at the start, for each one of the pieces that Eric and Dara spoke about today, we have a, uh, a two-page issue brief front and back that you could print out and use. The report has a little bit more details, and it's also, I think, um, very user-friendly in terms of, uh, of um, uh, cluing in on some of the issues that we have talked about today. Uh, it's really, even, even after working on this for many, many months, just hearing it again from Eric and, and from Dara, it, it's so striking, and, and hearing from Dara how, how things are changing gets to what I was saying earlier on about how uh, frustrated and, and angry um, we feel that in the face of these issues, um, CMS is, is essentially turning its back on residents and saying that they're going to be making things easier for the nursing home industry, reducing burdens, reducing the already low penalties when there is um, abuse and neglect of residents. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as Dara had, had mentioned, please um, visit us on the web. You can download or look at the Elder Justice newsletters, uh, the report, of course, access the, uh, the action page, as well as, as we note throughout the report and throughout the briefs, uh, we have, and, and throughout this program, we have a lot of resources. So if you're faced with these issues, whether mal malnourishment um, or abuse and neglect, et cetera, that there are... Uh, fact sheets, there are tools that are user-friendly that you can use to advocate. Uh, lastly, for ombudsmen in New York State, you can take a quick survey to, um, uh, to receive credit for attending this program. Uh, ombudsmen in other states, we'd welcome um, you to use that as well. Just let us know if you'd like to set that up. Um, thank you all very much. I'm going to open it up for questions. Now, if you have a question, you can either type it in or press star six to unmute yourself, and we can stay on for a few minutes longer if anyone has any questions. Uh, if otherwise, uh, always interested in hearing your comments, um, info at ltccc.org would be the best way to get us, but we're interested in hearing, of course, your questions and comments. Our next program is February 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it's going to be on using data to strengthen your nursing home advocacy. So we have some interesting uh, mapping and other tools that we look forward to speaking about. Uh, Sarah, are there any uh, questions in the queue? There are no questions in the queue. Okay, very good. Well, thank you all very much. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you again next month. Bye-bye now.